Hi folks. In this video, I would like to discuss some of the main points of Nora O'Neill's article, Kantian Approaches to Some Famine Problems. In the video, I will be borrowing from her text verbatim, sometimes with, sometimes without quotation marks. This is an acceptable practice as I am not claiming this work is entirely my own. In the article, O'Neill argues that she will explain some of Kant's attempts to provide a set of principles of obligation that can be used as the starting points for moral reasonings in actual contexts of actions. The action in question for the present paper is of course whether or not we are morally obligated to help famine victims. Remember that in Kant's ethical philosophy, the primary focus is on action rather than results the latter of which is the focus for utilitarianism. In the paper, O'Neill will use the second form of the categorical imperative, the one that is sometimes called the formula of the end in itself. The formula of the end in itself reads as follows. Act in such a way that you always treat humanity, whether in your own person or in the person of any other, never simply as a means, but always at the same time as an end. You will recall from reading Kant that a maxim is an underlying principle. An underlying principle of an act according to which our actions are guided. In the first form of the categorical imperative, the formula of universal law, the maxim of an act is universalized to see if the original act can consistently be acted on, that is acted uh, acted on without contradiction. In the formula of the end in itself, the focus is always on treating people as ends, never using them as mere means. We will use others as mere means if we are using them in ways in which they would not in principle agree to. This doesn't mean that we don't use people. People use us and we use people. When we engage in cooperative efforts, for instance, but even though we are using people as means in those situations, we are not using people as mere means. When I go to the grocery store, for example, I am using the grocery store clerk as a means to my end of having my items checked. But when I make a false promise, I have to use the person I am lying to as a mere means, a means to my end of getting money. The deceived party becomes, in O'Neill's words, a prop or tool, a mere means in the false promises scheme. So in the Kantian ethical scheme, acts done on maxims that endanger, coerce, or deceive others, and thus cannot in principle have the consent of those others are wrong. When we treat others as ends in themselves, we are treating them as rational and autonomous beings with their own maxims, but human beings are not ideal rational calculators because we don't always have all of the facts and many people don't have the ability to have complete rationality. To treat people as ends in themselves, I have to share and support their ends. I have to be concerned with other people's purposes if I want to have maximum, if I want them to have maximum rationality. As a result, O'Neill argues that Kantians are required to do what they can to avert, reduce, and remedy hunger. In O'Neill's words on page 514, bottom right, in Kantian moral reasoning, the basis for beneficent action is that without it, we fail to treat others of limited rationality and autonomy as ends in themselves. This doesn't mean that Kantian beneficence, beneficence won't make others happier, but unlike utilitarianism, which is all about making the most people happy and the least people suffer, the route to happiness for Kantians can't allow such things as manipulating the desires of others. Kantian ethics judges beneficence by its overall contribution to the prospects for human autonomy and not by the quantity of happiness expected to result. O'Neill says, if the calculations work out in a certain way, 
utilitarians may even think a generation of sacrifice, forced labor, or of imposed population control policies not only permissible, but mandated. Average happiness might best be maximized not by improving the lot of the poor, but by minimizing their numbers. This is utilitarianism, by the way. Kantian patterns of reasoning, on the other hand, are not likely to endorse neglect or abandonment of those who are most vulnerable and lacking in autonomy. Similarly, differences in the value of human life can be seen in the different moral reasonings between Kantian ethics and utilitarians. Utilitarians, since they value happiness above all, aim to achieve the happiest possible world. There is nothing wrong with using another human being as a means, or as a mere means, rather. Kantian ethics sees human life as valuable because human lives have considerable capacities for autonomous actions. Because of the categorical imperative of never using a person as a mere means, Kantian ethics holds that first, others must not be deprived of life, and second, others' lives must not be preserved, or others' lives must be preserved in forms that offer them sufficient physical energy, psychological space, and social security for action. That's not official, the, the legal social security, that's just uh, social security for action. According to O'Neill, where others' possibilities for autonomous action are eroded by poverty and malnutrition, the necessary action must clearly include moves to change the picture. Kantians must foster the capabilities that human beings need to function effectively. In her final section, O'Neill addresses two opposition approaches to welfare state politics. Libertarians who offer, uh, who favor liberty over equality argue that unrestricted rights to property without taxation is a human right. Alternatively, egalitarians who value equality over liberty argue for a very strong imposition of material equality. which would lay heavy restriction on individual liberty. O'Neill argues that in practice, societies have to strike some balance between liberty and equality. Good social welfare policies are an attractive way of accommodating liberty and equality because they ensure that nobody is so vulnerable that their liberty is wholly eroded. I hope this video has helped in your understanding of this very interesting paper. Thanks for your time and attention.